Welcome to Podcast on Tech Nation. This is a series of podcasts focused specifically on the biomedical and HTM industry. Episodes will be added monthly. Listening to each episode is eligible for one CE credit from the ACI. At the conclusion of this episode, you'll be able to access a link that will take you to a quick survey. You'll be able to download your certificate once you submit the survey. Before we begin today's podcast, I'd like to invite you to our full MD Expo. We will be in Orlando, Florida, October the 29th to the 31st. Registration is now open, so for more information and event details, please visit mdexposhow.com. Podcast on Technasia would like to thank our sponsor, Multi Medical Systems. When you're in the business of protecting the health of patients, you don't have time for malfunctioning medical equipment or dull surgical instruments. You need a reliable partner that can provide expert repair and planned maintenance to ensure you have patient ready equipment that meets or exceeds OEM guidelines and regulatory requirements. Multi-medical systems provides these crucial elements and others such as on-demand temporary biomedical staffing, endoscope and surgical repairs, infusion, pump, preventative maintenance teams and equipment sales. For more information, visit multimedicalsystems.com. In this episode, we are joined by Samantha Jacks, Vice President at McLaren Healthcare, and she will be discussing unpacking Congress's biggest HTM bill. Welcome back to HTM Insider. Gosh, we have such a great program for you guys today. I'm so excited to bring Samantha Jocks to you. Um, wow, what an honor to have her on as a guest. And we're going to talk about some really serious stuff that you might not know what's going on in some bills and legislation and the politics behind cybersecurity and some things that might be coming out here really soon. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sam, as she likes to be called. Sam, tell us who you are and what you do and where, you, where you're out of. Sure. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Sam Jacks. I am the Vice President of Clinical Engineering uh, at McLaren Health. McLaren's a 14 hospital system in Michigan and Ohio. Uh, and I've been around the HTM field for, for decades now. So, uh, so thank you so much, uh, Cheryl, for, for uh, having me on the podcast today. Oh, it's definitely our pleasure. I mean, you are so, gosh, you're so recognized in the industry and you're such, you're just such a go-getter. I just love your spunk and your smile and, and, you know, it's just such an honor to have you on. So with that said, I don't know if you guys know about this and I had to do a lot of research, so I'm learning along with you. Um, there's this bill called the Ominous Bill and there's a subsection in it. 3305. You might want to Google it. I don't even like the word ominous in this bill, and it's over 4,000 pages. Um, I've narrowed it down to a few sections, <laughs> and we're going to pick Sam's brain here a little bit today and kind of educate you and kind of what's coming down the pipeline for the HTM industry and cybersecurity in your hospital. So with that said, let's just talk about first, let me ask you, what is a cyber device, Sam? For those that don't know. Sure. So um, so the omnibus bill uh, that got passed this past December was part of the uh, the funding bill, right, that the government passed right before uh, December. Uh, and in it uh, included a whole bunch of content around cybersecurity, especially of medical devices. And so one of the items that were was in there um, was some statutory authorities that they gave the, the Food and Drug Administration. So... Um, to take you guys back, for those of you that, that aren't aware, um, there was this act floating around Congress for a while called the Patch Act. And so every year, uh, you know, for those of us, if we remember our sixth grade civics classes on how this stuff actually works, right? Um, bills have got to get passed by both the House and, and the Senate, right? And then they have to uh, go to the president's desk and be signed. Well, the Patch Act uh, passed one house, but not the other. And so um, the Patch Act allowed... Uh, a, a whole bunch of other rules and, and uh, requirements related to cybersecurity. So as a last-ditch effort, um, way back in fall, 
uh, the FDA spending bill came through Congress. And so the FDA spending bill um, is called the FDA user fee agreement legislation, right? So that makes a lot of sense. So, so right, the FDA is not actually funded by the government. It's funded by the manufacturers, right, who go to get their products approved, right? They get their 510Ks, they get their pre-market authorizations. That funding bill had to be reauthorized by Congress. So it went through Congress, um, and there were a bunch of requests, uh, none of which got passed. And so we thought all of the cybersecurity stuff that was happening in Congress was dead last year. Uh, lo and behold, right, the 12th hour in December, right, of 2022, um, it got added to the omnibus bill. So the omnibus bill uh, was actually a spending bill. What we're going to talk about has nothing to do with spending. Um, but in typical Congress fashion, right, they added it uh, in Section 3305. To your point, it's a 4,000 page bill. So those of us that have time to, you know, sit and read 4,000 page bills know exactly what's going on. So we're, we're going to spend a whole bunch of time telling you guys today exactly uh, what's in here so that you don't have to you don't have to do that. Right. I mean, it, it it's it's crazy. I mean, they put bills like they're sitting on Capitol Hill. Right. I remember the song Schoolhouse Rock. Uh, I just think, wow, you know, this is shoved into something that it shouldn't even be in, in my opinion. So what does this mean to the FDA? All right. So the omnibus bill gave the FDA all kinds of authority. OK, so uh, again, Congress is the only one allowed to pass laws. Um, so FDA uh, doesn't actually write law, right? We, we have instead something called guidance, right? So the FDA publishes guidance documents to help medical device manufacturers know exactly what to do when they're building and designing and submitting their products for approval. Those guidance documents don't have the weight of law behind them or didn't prior to the omnibus bill. And so it was really a please do this type of, uh, agreement, right? You know, um, you're going to submit to the FDA as a medical device manufacturer, please, 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 right? Include all of this stuff that we we find best practices. Now, of course, the FDA can deny publications or deny products coming through if they don't do it. Um, but fundamentally, it didn't have the, the weight of the law. What the omnibus bill did is it gave the FDA something called statutory authority to actually make laws. And so this is a very tightly designed uh, authority so that they can take uh, the role of Congress in in creating laws around uh, medical device cybersecurity. It's very specific to medical device cybersecurity. Wow, that's in a way kind of scary, right? Yeah, and there are there are other government agencies that have the statutory authority, and it's something the FDA has been asking for for quite a long time. Um, it's actually going to help us not only um, in the HTM community. Uh, but also, right, as patients, right? We want our devices to be cyber secure. And so um, we can now uh, look to the FDA to write laws and regulations and hold individuals and, and uh, corporations accountable if they don't meet those laws. So even though it sounds a little bit scary, right, to your point, uh, and it is a little bit different, I think it's actually a very positive step, right, to, to uh, ensuring the, the safety and effectiveness of devices that are in uh, hospitals today. So that being said, all right, so it's great for cybersecurity. It's great for patient safety. Uh, what's the response from the manufacturers? Yeah, so the manufacturers have a lot of work to do, which um, I know a lot of them have been scrambling because um, in the omnibus bill, there's actually deadlines for some of the things that are required uh, for both the FDA and for uh, manufacturers to do. So um, the bill outlines uh, two different paths. Okay. And so for those of us that live in HTM, we know we have stuff in our hospitals today, right? We're, we're going to call those current products on the market. I can buy them this minute. Current products on the market, of course, it's very hard to go ahead and create new laws around because they've already been approved, right? They've been through the, the approval process. They're currently on the market. So for any product that's currently on the market, manufacturers are required to submit a plan. And that plan has got to monitor, identify, and address in a reasonable time frame any cybersecurity vulnerabilities and exploit, uh, exploits. And that includes disclosure, right? How do we tell everyone there's an issue? Um, how do we know that there's an issue? And then how do we go ahead and turn around and create a patch and deploy that patch? So that process, right, a, a lot of the large manufacturers already have, right? We, we have um, 
large organizations that have a process to tell us about cyber vulnerabilities today. What this does is it requires all manufacturers to do the same thing. So it's really setting a level playing field for anyone that has products on the market. Now, for products that don't exist on the market today, there are additional requirements. So anybody who is now going to submit to the FDA starting, uh, I want to say it's 30 days, but I'd have to check prior, after the authorization, anybody who needs to submit has got some additional requirements. So first, uh, they have to design and develop processes to make sure uh, their systems can take post-market updates. So when they're in the field, um, they can actually get patches and can be updated, right? We're not going to continue uh, putting legacy devices out there that can't be patched. Secondly, uh, and probably most excited for those of us that live in, in a lot of cybersecurity worlds, is that all medical device manufacturers and products coming to the market will now require something called an SBOM. Uh, if you haven't heard of an SBOM, an SBOM is a software bill of materials. And what that is, is it's truthfully just a list, a big list of every piece of software, firmware, etc., that lives in the device itself. So when vulnerabilities come out, right, we'll now have a list to look at to say, is this product affected? All I have to do is scan down my SBOM. Is that software in my product? Then we have to worry about it. If my software is not in my product, right, I have uh, I have no concerns, right, over whatever uh, exploit or vulnerabilities out there. So it's really a, a, a communication tool. It's, it's helpful for those of us that own the products to know, are we in fact vulnerable to something that's going around uh, in the environment? Wow. So how much time is that going to take? You go, <laughs> we have so many biomeds out there that are, are just waiting for a job. Um because I think that means a lot of um, extra work. It sounds like I could be wrong. To yeah, the it's for, staff it, and to people like it, yourself. No, you're exactly right. Manufacturers have got to provide all this information now. But but to your point, what does that mean for us, right? Uh, those of us that live in hospitals, there is an immense amount of of work that's going to be coming our way. Okay, and and that work, uh, some of your or cyber departments do it. Some biomed departments have uh, cybersecurity within them. Um, they have monitoring and and patching uh, as part of their scope. What it really means is we're going to get a whole bunch more information, and we're going to have to figure out how to organize and categorize and and accept and and even uh, f figure out how to how to review that right when when stuff uh, is happening. Uh, and so, if if you're part of right, if any of your listeners are part of cyber departments, now is the time to start thinking about what those processes need to look like. What kind of staffing do you need? What kind of um, uh, work do you need to do internal to your organization, either with your IT partners or with your cybersecurity partners? Where do these roles and responsibilities live? Right? We all love to talk about who owns what, right, in the IT cyber HTM world. Uh, we we can't wait, right, until stuff starts hitting our desk to start having these conversations. Now is the time for departments to start thinking about how to ingest and digest all this new information that's going to be coming to us, right? Part of our role as HTM leaders, right, and HTMs within the field is we have to make sure our devices are safe and secure. And now that safety and security includes cybersecurity. And I realize those of us that have been in the field for years like I have, that's new. That's not something historically we've had to deal with. Um, but now is the time, right? N now the FDA is getting all these great new authorities. We're going to be getting all this great new information. We have to find a way to do something useful with it because it will help our patients in the long run. Are you guys collaborating as HTM leaders to use each other's ideas to make a process that might be easier to implement in hospitals across the United States? Because I see, honestly, you're at a 14 hospital system. In my mind, I'm thinking, what about all those rural hospitals? Yeah, there's a lot of groups that are trying to come up with processes and policies and tools that are available uh, to help those departments. And it's not just in the, the area of medical device cybersecurity, right, which is near and dear to my heart, but general cybersecurity in and of itself, right? To your point, Rural hospital systems may not even have a chief information security officer, right? They may have the three guys that run all of IT, um, and and they don't have the subject matter expertise. They don't have the knowledge. Um, there are organizations out there that are trying to help rural and smaller organizations define exactly what that looks like. 
Um, I know Health and Human Services, uh, as well as um, some of the large government organizations like CESA are really trying to put together um, best practices and and uh, minimum recommendations on what cybersecurity needs to look like. But none of that is baked yet, right? We're still flying the airplane while we're building the airplane, which um, makes it very challenging, right? And, and um, you know, one would think we all can easily figure this out. It's very different from hospital to hospital, hospital what equipment you have, what infrastructure you have, what staff you have, even who owns what, right, from a roles and responsibilities perspective is different. Um, you know, and so I advocate very, very highly that uh, now is the time to start having communications and conversations, right? You don't necessarily need to own everything. You don't need to be the subject matter expert, but you need to be in these conversations with your IT and your cybersecurity folks. I can guarantee you most of them don't understand medical devices, right? Just like most of our HTM folks are just learning about cybersecurity. It's time to start cross-pollinating those conversations so that we can all be in this together. Uh, again, with the with the focus that we all have in healthcare, right? We're here to make sure everything's safe and effective, right? Our patients are number one. Um, so it's not about, um, you know, who's uh, whose little scope there there is, right? Or, or, right, or we're treading on somebody else's um, expertise. We all got to start learning from each other to make it uh, safer and better for the future. Yeah. And I also think like working with the you know independent service organizations out there, right? That's a- another component that falls into, you know, the conversation, right? Because who owns it? That's you say, who's responsible for it? Right. And that goes exactly back to roles and responsibilities, right? Some uh, hospital systems have, have very robust in-house programs, right? Some hospital systems have a mix of in-house and or- outsourced, and some programs are 100% outsourced, right? And they're outsourced to ISOs, they're outsourced to OEMs, right? Um, you know, WE has a has a, a, a program where you, they can do your entire in-house biomed. Um, I'm not going to argue whether that makes them an OEM or an ISO. Fundamentally, they're responsible for safety, just like any of us in the HTM field. And so those conversations become more critical, uh, you know, in my opinion, because from a role and responsibility perspective, we need to understand who's doing what, right? Who's monitoring? Who's, right? Who's looking at all this information? Who's who's managing the risk? Who's identifying the risk? Uh, and then when something happens, who's responding, right? We need to have a, a robust response plan, right? When something occurs, it's, it's no longer, none of us talk about if something occurs anymore. Now it's when something occurs, right? What, what are we going to do? Um, and so to your point, it, it, this affects in-house, this affects ISOs, this affects OEMs. All of us need to be uh, on the same page with our playbook. And then who's going to, I mean, just thoughts coming into my head here, Sam, who's going to regulate this from the FDA's perspective into the hospital? Is that going to become another part of JCO or any other? I mean, oh. like... <laughs> I'm just thinking, like, who's going to be the watchdog? (laughs) Yeah, so this gets complicated again. So for for those of you listeners that don't know how the regulatory world works, right, uh, medical device manufacturers are regulated by the FDA, right? So the FDA has authority to go ahead and and put products on the market. But the FDA is not the one that regulates hospitals, right? We all have either Drug Commission or DNV that come in to to follow our uh, regulatory burdens. Now, Joint Commission and DNV aren't government agencies. They're deemed organizations from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, right? So CMS technically is the government agency that regulates hospitals, right, and physicians' practices and all that kind of good stuff. So CMS and the FDA both live in the same health and human services section of the government. So there is work being done in health and human services to start aligning some of this, right, because... Um, rules and regulations on the MDM side don't match rules and regulations on the CFS side. And those of us for years have been fighting with different regulations. Um, they align generally, right? Generally, we all want to do the same thing. But when we get down to specifics, they're they're different, right? CMS cares about um, patient care and they care about how patient care is delivered. Yes, they have specific regulations around medical devices. We've got a whole chapter, right, around medical devices. But that doesn't align, right, to the FDA requirements. So um, there is a government group, right, uh, working together to try and start aligning some of those ideas. Um, and, and once you throw cyber into the mix, I hate, t- I hate to tell you, it gets even more complicated, right? Because uh, 
CISA, right, the, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Agency, doesn't report to Health and Human Services. And CISA is actually responsible for all cybersecurity, not just hospital cybersecurity. So a lot of the guidelines that come out of CISA have nothing to do with healthcare, right? And they're written very generally for every uh, different industry that's out there. It doesn't matter if you're in manufacturing or finance, right, or healthcare. CISA's regulations cover all of those. And so the government is really trying to to put together a group to go ahead and stream like that. So, um, again, depending on how into government relations you are, um, Biden's administration created the office of under Biden's administration. They created the office of the National Cyber Director, um, who whose job it is to start wrangling right all of the cybersecurity requirements across all of the government. So that office has been working uh, throughout Biden's term to go ahead and start streamlining some of this. HHS is very engaged uh, and they're they're working diligently to try and get us some some streamlined recommendations and regulations that can then flow down to everybody. Right. Whether it be CMS or FDA. So what does that timeline look like? Oh, um, (laughs) I, I, I hate to say I wouldn't even hazard a guess at this point. Um, there are some recommendations that are um, that are they're being worked on, but I can't uh, I can't give you a timeline as to exactly when they're going to be out. The good news is they know it's a problem and they know they're working on it uh, to go ahead and try and get us some some clear regulations and recommendations to start moving towards. So, if you had the chance to put everybody in a big room, right? What are some takeaways? Like, what can you give some advice or? insight or just your opinion sam because it does matter and we're all we're all listening because i feel like this is going to be a lot of work for a lot of people it is and i think the one thing that i would tell you is don't go at it alone right so there are tons of resources and recommendations out there that you don't have to create on your own right we don't expect htm leaders we don't even expect CISOs, right to to um create the rule book on how to do this And so I'm going to recommend uh, one organization that you can either join or if you're not willing to join it, that's fine. They have tons of free documents out there for you to use, digest, and pretty much just implement. Uh, And that organization is the Health Sector Coordinating Council. Uh, The Health Sector Coordinating Council is a group, um, again, that's that's, uh, designated under U.S. national policy um, to help work with the government and private agencies um, to to create recommendations. And that group's been very prolific about writing guidance on how to do all kinds of stuff in this area. So please, if, if this is new to you, if you have no idea where to start, do not recreate the wheel. Use the resources that are out there, right, to, to understand and learn first, and then you can put a plan together for you and your teams to go ahead and start implementing. Um, don't, uh, don't try and start at ground zero. There's just too much out there. Well, yeah, I just can't even imagine. I'm, you know, there are still a lot of in-house single hospitals that are out there that I just feel like this is going to be a huge task for them. Um, Especially when you're comparing legacy devices to new devices and when your budget, you know, can only allow for you to buy pre-owned equipment in a lot of circumstances. Can we talk about that? Like, what are the legacy devices to the manufacturer buying pre-owned equipment or even rentals, you know, loaners that come in? Um, How does that all work together? Yeah, so um, legacy devices are a huge issue, right? And so um, just for just for the audience, um, the the, a legacy device, especially if you're going to use the official definition, is a device that can't be um, secured, right, from a cybersecurity perspective. And so um, that may be a device that's fully supported by the manufacturer. So I might buy it as a as a pre-owned device. It may still be supported by the original equipment manufacturer. I still could buy parts. I still could buy uh, service from it for from third parties and such. But uh, should an event occur, should a vulnerability occur, that device can't be patched. It can't be protected, right? And so. Um, if all of us look at our inventories, right, the majority of our inventories are considered these legacy devices. And that's very problematic, right? If I'm not able to secure uh, a majority of my equipment, uh, according to this definition, 
right? We should all be concerned, right? Because um, we need to we need to figure out other ways to go ahead and uh, ensure the safety uh, of the equipment uh, without actually touching the device itself. And so that involves IT, that involves network security, that involves other compensating controls to go ahead and mitigate the risk of having all of these legacy devices in my environment. To your point, I don't think hospitals are going to get away from buying pre-owned equipment, right? From having myriads of equipment within their organizations that are legacy. We're going to have to find other ways to go ahead and protect those devices outside of uh, getting a patch or outside of right, traditional uh, cybersecurity support for those devices. Yeah, I mean, and I'm also thinking right now, like, the funding, right? Where is this money going to come from? And you and I both know, hospitals across the nation, man, can we just dump some money into them, you know? Especially the smaller hospitals and smaller regions that are serving a population so they don't have to drive two hours to get to an ER, right? Where is this funding going to drop out of the sky at? The good news is people uh, at the right levels are asking that exact question. So, uh, again, for those of you that don't follow all of the stuff going on in Washington, Senator Warner um, pushed out a policy paper, uh, policy recommendations paper uh, a couple of months ago. And uh, one of the recommendations he made was that hospitals need incentives, right? We need additional funding. Uh, to go ahead and implement some of these minimum security practices because uh, smaller hospitals and even some of the larger hospitals don't have the resources um, to go ahead and secure themselves in an appropriate manner. We all know, uh, you know, cyber events are increasing, especially in the hospital world. Ransomware happens much more often than it did, you know, even two years ago. Uh, And so uh, a a concerted effort needs to be made to go ahead and get every hospital in the U.S. up to a minimum standard. Now, um, I wish I had better news for you that there's a a magic pool of money the government has. Um, Not that I'm aware at this point, but but it's being talked about, right? And it's it's, uh, being talked about at the right levels of government that we can't truly secure what we have without the appropriate funding. Um, And and funding is... is, is, uh, an easy way to say it, but but in reality, it's resources, right? Because even if we get a nice pool of money, are there the individuals out there that have the knowledge and expertise, right? We have a workforce issue as well, right? Um, I can probably count on my hand, right, the number of really robust medical device security personnel that are out there. Um, you know, it's a whole new field our HTMs are getting into, but the subject matter expertise is not in nearly as broad, right, as uh, uh, as it could be. And so, Workforce development is an issue. We need to find more staff. We need to train those staff appropriately, right? And then we need to put all of these requirements in place to go ahead and ensure that our devices are safe and secure. So there's work to be done on the hospital side. Obviously, there's work to be done on the manufacturer side to make those devices even more secure when they hit the market and are able to be updated when they hit the market. Um, but but like I said, the work, um, the work is out there, right? Um, one of... And you asked before what some of the recommendations I would make. One of the other things I would say is um, we as HTM organizations do not need to do it all, right? We're very used to risk ranking, right? We have have high-risk equipment and we have low-risk equipment. Um, We can use some of those same risk techniques to go ahead and prioritize our cybersecurity work as well. So even for those hospitals that don't have a ton of resources, right, we don't need to do it all. We need to start with our high-risk stuff. We need to secure the stuff that that is truly risky and put processes and policies and procedures in place um, and then continue to uh, eat the elephant for, for a better term, right? Well, we can't do it all um, and we can't do it all to your point without some additional funding, but we have to start somewhere with the resources that we have today. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll be honest with you, like at MMS, we've been getting, you know, requests to do implementations by 2024. People are starting to plan now. I mean, we see it. And that just all comes home now that I've read all this. It's all starting to make a little more sense just to me, you know? So a couple of things I want you to explain because I didn't know exactly what they were is HSCC and the SCCs. Like, how does that all come together? Sure. So uh, the Health Sector Coordinating Council... Um, 
started uh, a while ago. So uh, the government uh, designates what it's called critical infrastructure, right? So healthcare is considered one of the 16 critical infrastructure sectors, finance, right? Water, transportation, energy, all of them are critical to the functioning of the United States, right? So healthcare, right, is one of those 16 things. Um, so the Healthcare Coordinating Council uh, is a group of uh, organizations that represent healthcare that is the partner to the government, right? So we work with the government and represent the sector, the healthcare sector. So this public-private partnership is coordinated by CISA, right, and Homeland Security. So Infrastructure Security Agency and, and Homeland Security is responsible for making sure all these critical infrastructure sectors work so the U.S. can actually function. So the Health Sector Coordinating Council is one of the 16 coordinating councils, right, so as one of the 16 sectors. So that's the group that I mentioned before that really creates all of this guidance that's out there for you guys to go ahead and read and review. Um, members include everybody. We have industry partners, right? All the medical device manufacturers. There's pharmaceutical manufacturers. There's insurers. There's independent service organizations. There's hospitals, advisory groups. This is a massive group of agencies of anyone truly that has a health a stake in healthcare. So you guys listening to the podcast, if you want to join the Healthcare Sector Coordinating Council, you can and learn about what's going on and participate in creating these guidances. The free guidances are out there for you guys to go look at, and, and they cover all kinds of topics. The ones I'm going to recommend to you, um, there's a health industry cybersecurity practice, right? So it's a, a document that talks about basic cybersecurity. What are we supposed to do as healthcare organizations? What should we be doing? There's a specific medical device in health IT security plan. Right. So how do we work with our IT counterparts to put a plan together? I don't need to recreate the wheel. I'm going to go download the plan and I'm going to go work with my IT people on the joint plan that's already been developed. One of the newest things that's coming out uh, and will be released uh, any uh, any day now uh, is actually a legacy medical device uh, document. It's called um, the Healthcare Industry Cybersecurity Man Managing Legacy Technology uh, Document. Uh, we've just completed it. It's a uh, it's over 100 pages of things that we can do in our healthcare organizations to secure legacy devices, right? Uh, and so that guidance is out there for you. You again, you don't need to to recreate the wheel. Go get it. Uh, go download it uh, and review it, and then you can start planning on exactly what you and your organization can do to start securing uh, everything that you've got within your organization. So let's circle back. So it, I think it's kind of confusing. Again, legacy device. I want you to define that, how it's being defined today, and maybe in this document that's coming out. Sure. So um, those of us that have been around in HTM for, for years have all kinds of words, right? We have uh, end of production, we have end of support, we have end of, right, you name it. And what this group uh, did is they aligned with uh, a group called the IMDRF, the International Med Medical Device Regulators Forum. So Globally, we set the definition of what a legacy device is. So it's not the same as end of support. It's not the same as end of production. A legacy device is a device that cannot be reasonably protected against cybersecurity threats. And so it's very um, uh, mind bending for those of us that have dealt with all this end of life, end of service stuff for a long time. It has nothing to do with end of life or end of service. It has to do with, can you protect the device related to cybersecurity? So in my mind, as I'm talking cybersecurity, legacy equipment, right, are ones that we have a hard time securing, right? We can't patch it. We can't um, protect it in, in a way specific to the device itself. We've got to use different methodologies to go ahead and secure that device. So... Let's just talk one more time about patches and S-bombs, because I think for the newer biomed or maybe the new clinical engineering manager at a small hospital, this might be some really good like takeaway is talk about that S-bomb and talk about what patching actually is. All right. So patching is probably the easy one, right? So um, think about your phone, right? Or your uh, your tablet, right? Every once in a while, right? Generally on Tuesdays, Microsoft will send out right? Patch Tuesdays. We're going to patch all of the issues that are wrong with our operating system. You get a nice little notification on the bottom of your phone. Please install the update. 
right? You install the update and all of a sudden you're secure. Now think about all your medical equipment. How many of them have an automated, please patch our device? It doesn't exist, right? Larger, larger medical device manufacturers have created ways uh, for you to download patches. It usually requires you going to their website, right? Or them as manufacturers coming in and doing the patching for yourself. That you've got to take the piece of equipment down, you've got to update the software, and then reboot the piece of equipment. Those patches are not regular, right? So um, if we, again, if we align them to Microsoft, uh, Patch Tuesday for Microsoft is a thing. Every other Tuesday, right, you get patches. Medical device manufacturers don't have a schedule like that, right? And so we as biomeds, we as uh, information security personnel need to go out and look for these patches. And so part of your cybersecurity program should be a methodology, again, for risk ranking your equipment and for high-risk equipment going out and actually looking to see if patches are available. If patches are available, one of your tasks as a biomed is to implement your patches, which may require downtime. You may have to coordinate with your clinical folks right, to get access to the equipment and down it to actually do that patch. We should, as biomeds, be patching stuff on a regular basis. The number of organizations that do that is not nearly as large as it should be. So um, a patching methodology is, uh, as a requirement may be coming. It, right now, it's not a Joint Commission requirement. It's not a CMS requirement. There's been a lot of talk about it, but nothing is required now. Um, we should be building those programs into our biomed departments now, uh, if that's not something that your department has uh, today. Now, SBOMs are something completely different. Uh, again, an SBOM is a software bill of material. It's a list of software and firmware um, that is in the device. Today, these are not readily available, right? It's not like you can call up Philips or GE today and, and say, hey, send me all the SBOMs for the equipment I have. They don't exist. There's a group uh, working out of NIST, which is the Standards Institute, the National Standards Institute, to develop what a standard SBOM looks like. The problem is, right, hasn't been implemented yet. So if you get your hands on an SBOM, right, we're going to, you're going to have, some people have them in spreadsheets, some people have them in Word documents, some people have them in machine language. You can't, yeah, you can't actually read them. <laughs> and so as, a, as an HTM department, I'm going to tell you, tools will be developed to go ahead and ingest SBOMs. You don't need to create, recreate the wheel on how to go ahead and get the SBOMs. What I would tell you at this point is you need to start having conversations with your IT group, your cybersecurity group, on what you're going to do when they start coming to you. The whole process is going to be very much like the, the MDS-2s when they came out to begin with, right? How do you collect them? How do you review them? How do you risk rank them? What do you do with them once you're done with the initial risk ranking? So uh, it's much less of a detailed process, right, than the patching is. What you guys should be doing as HTM departments at this point is starting those conversations to say, when we start getting these, what are we going to do with them? Who's going to look at them, right? What do we care about? Um, what do we want to keep as information? And how are we going to keep those documents? I promise you, as, as this continues to, to grow and morph as a, a field, tools are going to start becoming available to make this much easier to us. Right now, those tools don't exist. And so we're left to our own devices to try and figure out a way to do that. So I hate to tell you, um, if I were going to prioritize as a small, rural, regional hospital with not a lot of resources, um, SBOM is a conversation, right, uh, and, a, and a rules and responsibilities thing. Patching is something you've got to figure out how to do. And so um, patching, of course, would be the priority uh, at this point to make sure that your devices that can be patched uh, are and you guys are keeping up to date with all the security features that are out there. Man, you know, gosh, that's a lot, Sam. <laughs> It's a lot. Oh, uh, man. I mean, would you maybe put together maybe a resource page um, and cite some locations that when people listen to this podcast, we could throw it up, we could put it out there, a place where people can go and read more? Because I think there's going to be a lot of questions. Well, then I hate to tell you, you know, part of what, what's very difficult about this is there's not one location for you to go learn about this. And uh, as an HTM, right, the, the true source of, of knowledge is not in a single place. Um, and a lot of the, the information that's out there is not specific to medical devices, right? It's coming from NIST or it's coming from CISA. 
right? And and it's very hard for individual biomeds to try and figure out how does this apply to me, right? Or even managers, right? Uh, how, how does this apply to me? How do I implement this? Um, I will be happy to put together a resource page for you guys. I will be happy to put together um, places you can go learn more um, because fundamentally cybersecurity is now one of those things that is becoming part of our day-to-day life. And even having a vocabulary, right, where you understand all of these crazy nomenclatures that I've been throwing out today has taken me years to get to, right? Uh, And I still Google stuff all the time, right? Tell me what this acronym means, because um, it's a very difficult field to try and break into. Uh, What I'm going to tell you and your HTM folks is that uh, even though it's difficult, uh, it's work we need to be doing, right? It's it's education we need to be um, continuing, right? And we need to uh, educate ourselves. We need to educate our staff uh, on cybersecurity practices and what we can be doing to go ahead and assure that that uh, safe and effective care is provided to our um, patients on a daily basis. It's it's a lot to take in, and gosh, I've learned a lot today. I did. I I'm glad I, it's called S bomb. I was calling it the S. B O M or whatever it was. Now I got it down, Sam. But wow, I mean, what what a great conversation. So we're gonna wrap it up. But I want to know. We always close with wow, your word of wisdom or your words. What would you like to leave the listening audience? Uh, my words of wisdom today are really just around continuing education. Right, um, cybersecurity is new to all of us, uh, and all of these topics are are things we don't deal with on a day to day basis. I would encourage you guys to continue growing and educating yourselves around all of these topics. Um, The continuing education piece of HTM is so incredibly important because stuff like this continues to develop in our field. And if you don't continue your education, right, you're going to be left in the dust. So please, please, please uh, continue learning, continue growing in your field. Uh, And there's those of us around here, obviously, to help uh, teach you all of these very complicated things that are occurring today. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. And uh, I appreciate uh, all the time we took today. Oh, it was just definitely our pleasure to have you on HTM Insider. I really want to encourage you folks out there, attend the conferences, beg, borrow, plead. Um, There's some coming up. There's the MD Expo. Um, Amy's coming up. Amy has a terrific lineup of educational classes at a very minimal or zero dollar to you. If you want more information and you don't have Sam's information, I'll be happy to connect you. But yeah, keep growing and keep learning. You know, it's important. This is patient safety. Patients are come first. And that's why we're in this industry. I know everyone listening is, you know, one with the servant's heart and they're there to provide right patient care and this is patient care you know it really is so continue to follow us on the htm insider listen to wherever you listen to your podcast if you need ceu credits listen on tech nation anytime to any one of the episodes and you can pick up one ceu credit and we will see you next time thank you Thank you, Samantha, for a great presentation. If you enjoyed today's episode, you might enjoy our ongoing webinar series, Webinar Wednesday. You can find a calendar of upcoming live webinars, as well as an archive of on-demand webinars at webinarwednesday.live. To obtain your certificate for one CE credit from the ACI, please remember to click the link located below this podcast title to complete today's survey. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com.